Wendy and Kurt from Resonate Music. Thank you for being here with us on the Made It in Music podcast. We appreciate you making the trek down. Y'all are busy people out <laughs> conquering the world of film and TV. <laughs> Thank so, you. Thanks for being here with us. Yeah. Um, why don't we just go all the way back in the beginning? Because I, I want to really dive in. And a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, are fascinated with how this whole behind the scenes world of, okay, songwriter writes their song, artist cuts the song, and then all of a sudden it ends up in Spider-Man or something. Like, yeah. we're going to get to the, all of that. But I want It happens that easily to you. Right? <laughs> That's exactly, yeah. And well, okay. one person that has to say yes. I guess we can stop the interview right there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, you can start us off and then we'll, we'll get to Kurt. But yeah. what was your very first dollar that you made in the music business? Um, hmm, that's a tough question, actually. I think if it's the music business side of things, um, I got a job at a radio station right out of college. So on the business side of things. And then later on, it probably would, would have been when I started playing around town and, you know, selling CDs and getting tips and stuff for playing shows and stuff like that. So, so. you playing shows as yourself as an artist? Yeah, I would just singer songwriter kind of stuff. Yeah. And back up in a band, little things like that where, you know, you'd leave with 50 bucks and thought that was a big deal. So, yeah. Yeah. In Nashville the whole time? <laughs> um, Los Angeles some of the time and then Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What about you, Kurt? Uh, so I answered. So I grew up playing piano. Yeah. I started when I was I started taking lessons when I was six and played studied piano all through college and so when i was the summer after eighth grade before my freshman year in high school i answered an ad in a paper in my hometown um like a cover band I was looking for a keyboard player so i i had already i already owned my owned my my first synth and my dad drove me to the <laughs> to the audition anyway i got the gig and so i started gigging professionally that summer yeah at whatever 13 years old so that was my first dollar we played at a place called a total dive bar called Alibaba's <laughs> in Joliet, Illinois. I love and, it. And the, the, yeah. stage, the stage was as big as this carpet. And um, yeah, that was my first dollar, I think, make, you know, as a musician. Sure. At 13. Yeah. So you guys both kind of got into it, like wanting to be on the creative side, not necessarily on the maybe on the business side. Is, is Am I hearing that right? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, growing up, I, I always just figured, well, I'm going to be a touring uh, you know, musician and be a rock star. Sure. <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> things expanded from there, but, we, but you know, and yeah. thankfully, you know, I mean, I still play it. I love it, but sure. yeah, I got into it from the player, from the players yeah. perspective. So, and I think I'm the same way. I mean, yeah. for me, I grew up performing I was a competitive figure skater and I was Hold on, on a second. Yeah. <laughs> You just kind of, that's not a detail, you just glance, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I think it was, I was always very drawn to choreography and music and at a very young age. And so for me, I kind of, um, I loved performing for sure. And so my love for music kind of just like grew from that. And so the desire to want to um, explore writing and then, you know, pick up guitar. I mean, I didn't even... I don't read music. I never have, but I picked up a guitar when I was like 24 and I was just hell bent on learning how to play at least rhythm guitar. Yeah. Um, it was very difficult, you know, picking that up at 24, and, but I did it. I was able to accompany myself when I played shows and stuff. So have you ever combined those passions, competitive figure skating? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's Maybe like, we can start a side a, business. I don't know. That's no. an Olympic thing. They have skiing and shooting. Yeah, so. exactly. They have skating and <laughs> guitar. <laughs> I will say when I did, I, I competed until from like nine until I was 17. And um, I never really loved the slow music. I always liked very fast, very energetic driving music. So um, I guess I didn't always fit the typical like figure skating mode at that time. <laughs> but but yeah, I was definitely drawn to more of the performance and the creative side of music, for sure. So are you naturally a super competitive person? You know, not really. I like my brother and sister are super competitive and everyone's competitive with each other in my family. I'm very competitive with myself, actually. So I've always found it like when I feel like I'm starting to compete against others, there's kind of like a, a feeling that I get that I don't like. Um... Like it's like a, it's an internal thing. So I think I shift the focus on like, how can I do my best? Mm. So it's kind of a focus thing for me. And once I take the focus off of like competing and I just focus on what my goals are, um, I think it helps me. So maybe not naturally competitive. I think I've had to train myself how to like block it out and put the blinders on. Sure. Yeah. But I imagine that <laughs> has helped in, in the music business, though, having that. 
Yeah. Because it's not, you know, we always talk on the show and, and, and really in our culture try to make it a, more of a spirit of collaboration than competition. Yes. Exactly. yes. I like that better. Yeah. yeah. But a little competition does exist and you want to be making the best, doing the best in your, in your field. So yeah. I have to think that's spilled over. So, and obviously yeah. you guys are killing it right now. Um, can you talk about the journey between that first gig and Joliet and, you know, your first dollar that you made and, and, and when you were able to actually go full time and, and jump into the music business? Um, I, I feel really fortunate in that I never had a huge gap where I wasn't doing music. Hmm. Um, I went through, you know, I studied music in college. Um, I had a period of maybe about a year, maybe nine months after grad school that I was really not, um, doing what I wanted to do, but I was still doing music. I was actually playing piano in a lounge in a hotel hmm. at night. And that's what I, that was my first sort of, you know, gig, but that wasn't obviously what I wanted to do. I mean, I was using my, my gift and my skills. So at least, you know, I wasn't working during the day. I had my time to like send out, you know, demo tapes and stuff, but mm -hmm. I was, you know, at that point I was pursuing writing, uh, you know, for advertising. So I was up in Chicago, hmm. um, uh, you know, fast forward to me moving to Nashville doing more writing down here, production, um, getting connected with a music house in Nashville here that did music for advertising, which is actually where I met Wendy. Hmm. So that's the fast forward to, you know, go from playing, basically being a keyboard guy to writing and then getting in, you know, us starting the licensing thing together and then being now doing, for me, doing, you know, half on the business side and then half still writing and being creative and producing and can you talk about just this the 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 start of that i mean how do you go from you know wanting to do it to actually doing it like getting that first gig working for an advertising agency or was it a publishing deal or how, how did you how did you do that um just networking i mean in nashville i met a guy that had a company that did you know music for advertising so yeah. i just began writing for him and, and that led to me becoming a creative director there and you know basically being ingrained in that world for quite a long time so sure um and can you can you go a little more granular on it too like what were you doing is are, are they sending you like here's a brief here's yes um, mm -hmm. a lot of people listening maybe maybe don't even quite know what a brief is or like right. what sure. you know can you can you explain that a little sure. bit sure so sometimes if you're lucky you'll get a rough cut of you know a video clip that you'll be writing music to for the commercial a lot of times it's storyboards which are just handwritten uh, for people that don't know it's just like you know this is going to happen for five seconds and then this happens and it's it's just on one just sheet pictures yeah yeah um so you get your rough timings before they actually, you know, because they, they need that before they shoot the spot. So um, a lot of times you're just writing to that. Sure. They'll give you a storyboard. They'll give you a reference track. We like the energy of this. This is guitar driven, blah, blah, blah. You know, this, that kind of thing creatively. So you've got guardrails, which is important. And actually moving into, you know, what we do with the licensing, it's always good. We always have guardrails mm. with with how we work. Um, sure. But so for the advertising thing, for sure, you're you're operating in this you know, so yeah. uh, there's a target. Yeah. 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 It's good. So I want to hop over to you real quick. What, yeah. what was your journey between that first, <laughs> yeah, the first dollar and, and going full time? Um, my journey was not quite like Kurt. <laughs> um, I feel like I was like chugging down the highway, er, wayside, back on the highway, <laughs> er, wayside. Um, I tried a lot of things and I sometimes look back and think like, Oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have just kept going on this thing. But I think that all those side, you know, road stops essentially are what propelled me to get to the place. So I kind of now I have a different perspective on it. But um, getting my start in radio um, and then, you know, starry eyed, I'm going to move to California and um, and study acting and plan a band and do all that kind of good stuff, which I did. Um, I learned a lot about um, diving into story when I was like studying acting in mm -hmm. LA. Um, and I think that's where my desire to start writing music really is where it kind of bit me. Um, I started singing back up in a band and I had a really good friend and we started 
writing songs. And I think that that's where I really started to explore this like storytelling thing. Um, but my path is really unique in the sense that I was always kind of trying to financially provide for myself to keep moving forward to develop skills in music to see where that would take me essentially. So one of the biggest breaks I feel like I had that eventually led to what we're doing right now was um, my resume got passed to a woman who was managing voice talent in mm. Los Angeles. Really interesting. I was like, what's this all about? Sure. Um, and she's like, oh, you know, we have old radio guys. I see you have a background in radio and mm. they do like, you know, commercials and movie trailers and, and um, you know, network promos. And I was like, this sounds really different okay um she's like but i think with your background i think it would be really interesting to meet with you and one thing led to another and i ended up working for her for quite a long time actually mm. um it was there where i kind of fell in love with film and television marketing mm. um but this music bug was always kind of still there um it was like i couldn't ignore it i don't know how else to really express it it was like this is almost the perfect job for me creatively and I loved building talent. So I think that there were like foundational things that were like innate in me that I felt very drawn to, but I kept like, ooh, the music thing. And I think I thought I wanted to be an artist at mm. that moment still. Um, I would later come to find out that uh, lifestyle as an artist wasn't probably the best fit for me mm. um, just as a, as a person yeah. uh, because of, I think, the t you know, touring and the different things that I wasn't really like. And I was older when I was kind of getting into playing music and writing music. And so um, I worked in Nashville then and I worked in radio again for ABC Networks. I worked for a little label. I did PR um, and I worked for a PR company that basically was a catalyst to me getting exposed to music supervision. Hmm. It was 2008. Um, there was an event that I was doing PR for in Nashville called um, Nashville Screenwriters Conference. Mm. And it brought all these music supervisors from Los Angeles and to Nashville. And that's kind of where I feel like things were starting to intersect and I hadn't really known how that was all going to play out later. Sure. Um, so my journey was definitely still like, I don't know, it was probably on some other like, <laughs> <laughs> loop at that point sure. still trying to figure it out um and you know meanwhile i was still working for that company in los angeles again after the pr gig and um the idea was that you know one day maybe i would take over this company and working for them again for me was kind of like all right if we sell voiceover talent, what about also working with independent artists from Nashville and kind of merging those things together? So that idea kind of started marinating for me in 2009. Um, but that company really wasn't interested in adding that service. Um, so I stayed on with the company, but I feel like, again, it was this nagging feeling that I was like, okay, I'm not quite doing what I want to be doing. Um, and there was like a sense of, you know, I just felt unsettled. I was making a great living. I loved building talent. Again, there were a lot of foundational things that I liked. And I started looking for companies in Nashville. I was working remotely with a company in Los Angeles for a couple, like three and a half years at that point. And I started looking for companies around town that were would be a good option or other people I could work remotely for in Los Angeles, yeah. kind of bringing everything together. And believe it or not, this is a very condensed version. And sure. <laughs> what happened was I have a friend that worked at an agency in town, an ad agency. Um, and she was like, man, this company came in today and they they presented and it was like, you know, they do audio branding and like music supervision, music licensing, voiceover. And I was like, this is interesting. This kind of is like what I've been looking for. And so it was a small company in Nashville that had a little office in Germany as well. Hmm. And um, I met with the owner of the company nine times over the course of a year. Hmm. <laughs> um, they did not have a job opening. So to all of you out there that want to do something, just keep knocking on the door, even if they don't have a place for you. More coffee? <laughs> More food. <laughs> um, hey, let's meet for coffee, um, mm -hmm. because that's such a thing in Nashville. It's but, great advice, though. No, really. really and it was, you know, yeah. they weren't hiring. Yeah. And 
And, you know, I always say to people, don't wait for an opening. But I actually think that that's how I've grown the business. And I'll touch on that later is like, don't wait for a brief to come in. Mm. Don't wait for things to come to you. Go get it. And I really think that that mentality has changed everything for me, whether it was voiceover or wanting to do things myself. I was calling companies that I wanted to be a part of. And so they finally hired me. (laughs) They had an opening and they hired me. I took a massive pay cut, Mm. but it was kind of one of those things where I was like, I was just stripped down to the bare bones and ready to go. Yeah. You know, and I, I felt a fire to do it. And, you know, I wasn't there very long before I decided, I think we should start a licensing division. Mm. And they're like, all right. I mean, it's really competitive, but, you know, everybody was just kind of busy doing their thing there. And they're like, if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. So, I mean, I was doing voiceover casting and booking voice talent contracts, going after other new business simultaneously, trying to get artists assigned to me. That's, you know, with a company that had no track record of giving anybody (laughs) placements. Yay me. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, it was very different in the beginning than how it turned out. Um, But I will say that there was a fire there. And I don't know if it took all those years to kind of like get to a place of feeling that convicted for me. Some people find that really young. And I don't know if I just had to stumble a lot until like I just wasn't willing to do anything less than what I wanted. Mm. Um, Again, I wish I had it younger, but something happened. But all those years, that's the bedrock of what we're doing now. I mean, those those connections and those relationships. So, (laughs) you know, it may may have felt like it was- It felt like that, that, but now I'm like, oh God, it all made sense. It's like a puzzle. Yeah. 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 That's so good, man. And, and I, I don't want to gloss over that, that just keep knocking on doors until something happens. Yeah. Or, as we say all the time, if there's no door, then build one. Sounds like that's what you kind of Yeah. Do. I mean, yeah. I think it's like, and again, I always, I see this sometimes in young people where they're like really convicted, like I felt later in life. And so like, but I think it was all of that um, knowledge and understanding of film and TV marketing and all of a sudden that gave me the confidence, you know, and maybe it's that Kurt started playing music when he was really young. So I do think, you know, it kind of comes back to this, like, what are you spending time building and developing? You know, they call Nashville a 10 year town. And I, you know, that happened to me, you know, I've been here now 12 years. And I remember when I hit the 10 year mark, everything was changing. And I kind of had to laugh. Like I was changing for you for the better. Yeah. Like finally everything clicked. And I was like, oh gosh, it's so cliche. Nashville's a 10 year town. And, and all of a sudden I had that moment. I was at third and Lindsley and with some friends and it wasn't even for work. And they had like some sign up on the wall that said Nashville. I don't, you know, it was kind of lit up in lights. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I've been here 10 years. And like, it just seemed Mm -hmm. kind of like, Oh, I didn't really think that that was like, really? It takes that long? (laughs) Uh, But I think people do. People stumble and fall as an artist or whatever. And um, I guess that looking back now is like, sometimes I get emotional about it because I'm like, man, you you do have to fail a lot to finally find success, I think. And if you're you're too afraid to take chances, you know, I've taken lots of chances. Mm. Lots of things haven't worked out. But then when they do, it's like, it tastes pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And meeting Kurt, I was like, what a divine appointment, essentially, because our skill set, you know, it was very, so complimentary, very complimentary. And <clears throat> I, I really believe that that taking that chance and, and joining that company was, you know, maybe it was a blip on the radar for us in the long run. But I think that what grew there was going to be something really special, you know, mm. so do you guys both feel like that's actually funny. I've never heard that Nashville is a 10 year town. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we had somebody on our podcast uh, last season that talked about it being a seven year, like mm. move to Nashville, stay seven years. Do you feel like it's a 10 year town? Is that pretty accurate to what you, obviously your experience, but yeah. what about you and the artists you work with? Um, man, I, I, I've heard all kinds of different numbers. I mean, I, <laughs> honestly, when I moved here, I heard Who made it was, that number. It up? was a three exactly. year or a five. You it know, sounds good. There's a good alliteration. Ten yeah, year right. Town. Ten year town. Yeah, that's it's right. Good I country like that. song. <laughs> there you go. I read We're that one today. Ten of Tennessee. I don't know. Maybe that ten thing just comes up. I don't know. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I, you know, I mean, to some degree, it's what you make of it. You know, I yeah. mean, sure, you have to put in some time, um, but once 
once you get, you know, it's just connecting the dots and yeah. then that momentum builds and then it, it, you know, becomes a lot easier. Sure. Yeah. Uh, That's so good. So a lot of times on our podcast, we'll have artists on yeah, and uh, we're talking about their stories and how they're getting heard. It's just, I always love getting to hear from people behind the scenes. And I know our people watching and listening do as yeah. well, because you guys are instrumental in helping people discover new artists and new music. And, um, you know, somebody sees a commercial on TV and it says in the bottom left hand, there's Sam Tenez with whatever song. Yeah. yeah, right. Can right. you talk a little bit about that and what you what it is that you do and how you are helping artists be discovered on a big level? Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when we first started out, we were just trying to gather as much music as we could. And people were, you know, hey, here's my EP I just finished. And maybe you guys, you know, can you can you pitch it? Um, you know, we found that that doesn't, really work um as well as us working strategically you know if you bring us your ep odds are you know maybe you've thought about sync but maybe you haven't and if you haven't then it's probably going to be pretty tough mm. because the you're, they're, the songs aren't going to do what we need them to do for marketing and so you know having written for so much in the advertising world and wendy's worked on the marketing side we have a good grip on kind of what works and why does it work you know and messaging is super important sure as well as the music needs to do xyz for these kinds of applications just like if you're writing country song you're gonna know it needs to, it's gonna have to do this because we're working in country or pop's gonna need to do this right so sync is its own thing you know just like any other genre you know i mean um yeah. so uh i think what what is working is us knowing the market well and having clients that say hey if i had stuff like this you know it's working because it's doing this and you're yeah. like okay it's not like dots yeah um so at some level it's actually pretty simple hmm. although i mean getting it right is you know and then getting jumping through all the hoops and getting you know i mean trailer is impossible there's just so <laughs> many that, you know landing a, a song into a big campaign is is difficult sure there's a lot of people that have to say yes but but in terms of us you know hedging our bets creatively and working with artists that's why we win because we're giving them direction yeah i'm not just saying i'm not going to set you up with the right just go go write something you know it's going to be like it's i need you to do this it needs to be this style messaging can be along these lines you know we're going after this type of thing sure or we know that this trailer house mm -hmm. does a lot of horror films sure. so let's dial in on that you know sure. yeah so it's again like she said it's not waiting for a brief it's knowing this shop does these kinds of movies trailers and this shop works on these kinds of projects which typically use this kind of music so and then you connect the dots with the right brand sure yeah. you're like if if they're using very up-tempo happy positive you know boom boom party music you're like okay who's doing that that we work with okay and then you say all right let's get more of that for this client yeah so a lot of times it's not you know i think back in the day when people start writing for sync just to like add to what you're saying is that you know we're really looking at what brands exist already, what artists is already doing that and helping them steer that ship with their brand yeah. already. Not yeah. trying to create something different or new, but trying to develop more content in a particular brand lane that's going to sell well yeah. to a particular yeah. client. Because I want stuff released. I want stuff to go. I want it to be part of an artist project that they're really pushing. And so not just like, whimsical like let's write a song that just sits in our you know right and as much pitches. as we are a licensing company which we are and that's you know that's what we do i mean we're also essentially acting as a and r yeah and yeah. publishing yeah connecting writers and producers setting those up giving them direction weighing in on it creatively helping the process get you know helping it get across the finish line in a place where we know it needs to be quality wise and you know messaging and performance and you know Within that artist's sound, you know? Sure. So it's that X, it's that perfect bullseye of, yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to work for sync, but they could potentially release this. 
Well, it's become such a buzzword, I feel like, in Nashville and probably yeah. other, other places, too. And, and just rightfully so, as a result of things changing in the, the, the business, mechanicals are going away. Yeah. Right. Um, which you may, you guys may have more insight on this, but I know they just were bragging about how they raised the mechanical rate in Congress or something. But I'm like, does that even affect anything? <laughs> like if that's going to disappear in two years? Like, yeah. woohoo! <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Short term party is what you call that. Exactly. I, I don't know. I don't. I haven't seen that really affect anybody yet. I mean, there's some other really cool stuff that streaming platforms are integrating. Yeah. You know, where it's like songwriter credit or remixers getting the same type of play counts that are coming from other artist pages and things like Which that. Which is fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic, yeah. and yeah, I love sure. it. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me. I, I haven't seen it too much yet. I think I don't know if that's really going to be a game changer. Yeah. But it's exciting to see that they're you know trying to make some changes, and I think as the music business continues to, you know, unravel and rebuild, yeah. essentially, um, I think that you'll see. I just think the music business is changing dramatically. Sure. And what we what we have known to be standard or par for the course, I think, is going to you know continue to unravel over the next several yeah. years. I mean, the way publishing works is changing. Um, a lot of publishers are really taking masters um, because, you know, master is king right now. Will that change in the future? Can you stop right there? Because yeah. there's a lot of people that, I mean, there's this whole curse of knowledge. We work in this every day. There's yeah. these terms. What do you mean by that? Master is king? Because that's really important concept for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think we hear a lot of that right now. And I think that the reason being is that, you know, the model has shifted, you know, what was once terrestrial radio and I got my start in terrestrial sure. radio, um, you know, and how publishers were paid from that and how they functioned, you know, collectively with PROs. And now you're looking at streaming platforms, which essentially are also partly owned by labels. Um, I've seen you've seen you know, we've seen a bait and switch, yeah. essentially, you know, now it's all of a sudden, you know, who owns the master is really the one that's collecting. Yeah any of the streaming money. And just so everyone knows, the, yeah. master, the master is the sound recording. Yes. The publishing yeah. are the people who wrote the song. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. that for your and that's good for people yeah. people listening and watching. Because most of the time, songwriters have not participated in the master side. Correct. Correct. And Which is, so the, yeah. the inequality with, with Spotify paying that's out, where it is. The, master, yeah. the master owners make more than the, the publishing and the way, writers. So way, way more. It's, yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. even comparable. Yeah. And if you um, have a major label deal or a label deal, you know, depending on what your deal structure is with your label, you may not be seeing any of the, the streaming yeah. revenue, um, of course, right? right? You know, against advances or recoupment or any of that. But if you're an independent artist and you know how to work Spotify, um, I've seen that, you know, I have one management client and I've seen streaming, not just on Spotify, but through YouTube and other platforms, change everything for us. But you can't yeah. just slap it up there and think, you know, oh, great. I put it up through whatever online and it just they put my songs out there and it, hopefully it gets picked up by a big list. If you know how to work it and to market it through social media and digital media marketing, perhaps you might start to get more of those looks and get picked up on lists and every million streams equates dollars yeah and yeah. you know all the money the ad revenue on youtube can become quite lucrative and i've seen this in my approach with cercina it's yeah. a piece of the pie you know the, yeah. the streaming is a, uh, an, an income stream you know sync can just be like an income sync. stream yep. you know there's it, it's not going to be i think the days of it just being oh you're going to sell a million records and you're going to make you know all this money sure yeah and, you know that yeah, we've moved on from yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's where sync has become the buzzword is, OK, let's get together and write for sync. Most people don't even know what that means, though. They do it completely backwards. And exactly like you said, we're like, oh, let's just make an EP. And this right. sounds whimsical. And yeah, sure. Like, like, what are some things that people do wrong and things that people could do better to, to, to set themselves up to win? I, I'd love to take that because Kurt kind of touched on it a little bit ago when we talk about like it's the perfect intersection, like X marks a spot, right? And I think when we were starting to do sync with people in the beginning a little bit, like, hey, let's think we need more of this. We should do this. And as it moved on, you know, there's also kind of a backlash against sync, right? Sure. Let's say you're a major or whatever. You know, these artists are shopping for deals, et cetera. And it's like they're looking for other avenues, right? You know, outside of music licensing or whatever. 
And, oh, well, they're just a sync artist or they're just that. And I was like, well, hold on a second here. I think, you know, we're in a unique position because we haven't just gone after film and television as far as a song in the television show or a song in the film. Again, Kurt and I's background was a lot more um, on the commercial marketing side, um, whether it's TV film marketing or you know brand specific marketing and advertising. And so the music that's typically chosen in ad campaigns, be it for film, TV, um, or, you know, like we talked about ad, um, commercial ad, is been a lot of music that sounds recognizable, music that sounds like it could be on top 40. And I all of a sudden was like, you know, yes, you're going to have the dramatic cinematic stuff. Great. That has a place, right? It definitely has a place. But let's start looking at the brands that we're working with and the music that they're making. How can we help them have songs that quite frankly, would get signed by a label, would get played on the radio, you know, can climb up Spotify charts, can do these things. And to me, that's what I call like the, you know, the after the sync. Yeah, yeah. You know, what happens yeah. after the sync? And for a long time, people are like, oh, you don't have to, you hear this in, in sync world. Oh, you don't have to release it. You don't have to do this. And it's like, maybe but not. Actually, actually, a lot of our, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of our clients are saying, has this been released or is it planning to be released? You know, because yeah. that does matter to a lot of them. Right. Because they, they obviously want the first look probably, right? If they're <clears throat> pushing, you're, you're talking about it from a label standpoint? I'm talking about from... <clears throat> oh, as far um, as this music houses and people. Yeah. Well, yeah. From our clients. Be yeah. It, and, you yeah. know... Um, Trailer House yeah, or yeah. Network. Or, CMT or MTV or, yeah. you know, they're... they're or, yeah, any network. They're, they're asking those questions. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Man, this could be like an entire like, three, <laughs> four hour... We need a part two. Class. Yeah. <laughs> there should be a part two. We should actually just have you guys like sit down Intermission. and make it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I want to jump into our full circle five. Yeah. Uh, first question: What is the record or book you most commonly recommend to people? Go ahead. <laughs> Ladies, okay, I answer. have I have two books. Um, and they're equally important to me. One is The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, which is all based on the theory that anything you do for 10,000 hours, you become an expert at, which I touched on earlier. Um, that really was a catalyst for me. And I think about it all the time and I talk about it often. The second book is called The Art of the Start. And it's a book by Guy Kawasaki. And the book talks about, you know, do you want to start a business? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> Go get them, Tiger. But no, it really does. It has this mentality. And there are some hard questions in there. Are you selling something that people need? And, you know, I've been in certain situations where I've asked myself this question about companies I've worked for, this or that. And a lot of times I'm like, these are simple questions that I think if people were really asking themselves in any situation, do people need this? Do people want this? You know, what is the need for it? And that was a big catalyst for me before um, before starting Resonate. I wrote down all these ideas in the back of the book years ago, mm. and a lot of it has come to fruition, mm. strangely. It, like, is super creepy. <laughs> so good. Those, I, those two books. I love Outliers. I'll have to read that. I'm yeah. a voracious reader. So yeah, it's I really good. Yeah. The 10,000 10, hours, 10... Hour a year or a thousand hours a year in the 10 year, yeah. There you go, <laughs> yeah. Well, which is why I think you know, I was fortunate enough to, like, like I said, Start I started early. taking piano lessons when I was six, so I had my 10,000 hours in, yeah. You know, probably by the time I was in high school, I imagine, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Which is why at 13, I was in a band sure. with 40 year olds, you know, <laughs> gigging on the weekend, which is ridiculous, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> so, f favorite book or record that you most commonly recommend? Um, to people? I'm not a big book guy, but I mean, I did. Speaking of Guy Kawasaki, I didn't he write um, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Close. Kiyosaki. Okay. okay, another one of my favorites, though, yeah, another one of my favorites. Um, I think for me, you know, that I, th and I think for musicians, it's, it's, I mean, it's important for everyone, but especially for sort of musicians that are self-employed, you know, the idea of passive income. Yeah. Um, just thinking, mm -hmm. you know, I think we all get caught up as creative people like, oh, I just gotta, I just gotta keep being creative. And, you know, there's that energy and you feel like, well, when I'm writing or, you know, I'm, I, you feel like, Hey, th I'm doing work, but you might not be like, if, if, if you and I are just writing a song just to write a song, like I'm probably not going to do it because again, there's no strategy. Like what's, I what's love being creative, but it needs a point, you know, yeah. at some point in your life, you have to, you know, you've got to be smart about your time 
And then you also have to be like, okay, I don't want to have to physically uh, work for every dollar. And that's not a that's not being lazy. That's just being like, hey, how can I create other streams of income? Yeah, yeah. so good. Um, yeah. And so the Rich Dad Poor Dad kind of like enlightened me to that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Nobody's brought it up on on this podcast yet. We we talk about it in other conversations a ton. It's it's probably in my top five favorite yeah. books of all time. And and in fact, I met Robert on a real estate event, and he okay. said told me something personally that kind of I kind of changed my life and it was just this simple fact of if you feel like you're stuck just do what you fear most just yeah. do what you fear most yeah and for me at the time this was three years ago okay. that was public speaking like oh, wow. literally just sitting even here this would have been sure. paralyzing for me wow so he well, you can't even tell that's yeah. amazing <laughs> no no no. but but, but so I, I went out to LA and worked with a voice coach and really just kind of helped get my confidence up. And so that was half of, this is a complete sidebar, but just because you, I'm going yeah. down this rabbit yeah. trail, you said the book. Um, yeah. So he, he definitely changed my life first with a book, but then just by telling me that, yeah. you know, directly one-on-one. -on -one, so that's, that's great. Awesome. That's really good advice. I'm going to remember that one and too. And then do what you fear most. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then my album would be, I don't know, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. You can't go wrong with that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so a uh, little bit of a strange question, but we'll start with you, Wendy. Do you have a favorite failure? Here's what I mean by that. Failure mm -hmm. can become a gift if it changes your behavior or perspective on something or if you just learn something that you're like, I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. In that case, do you have a favorite failure? I do have a favorite failure. It's easy to identify. Um I moved back to California a second time and I moved out. I got some desk job and I was there one month. Um, and the day before my 25th birthday, they laid off uh, 60 people. Mm. Um, so I had no job. Um, it was one day before my birthday and I had to file unemployment. Mm. Uh, but it was at that company. <laughs> and again, I just had no financial help. So it was like, all right, back to doing whatever I need to do to pay my bills. But my resume got passed to that company. Mm. Um, and it wasn't a couple months later, but that really changed the course of everything for me. That mm. was kind of the beginning of what would eventually come to fruition. Sure. Um, I just was like, and then I got a, a ticket for not stopping completely at a stop sign the day after that. So it was a rough uh, <laughs> 25th turn, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it stands out to me. Yeah. It's good. For sure. It's good. What about you, Kurt? Favorite favorite failure? Favorite failure. Man, mine's more on a personal level, not necessarily on a business <laughs> level, but, um, you know. It's a safe place. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I was in grad school at the University of Miami, and we had a class on Tuesday nights called, you know, just Tuesday night rhythm section where we had to um, write charts for, you know, bass drums and two guitars, mm. essentially. And so that those charts would get recorded. So I was entrusted with bringing the machine from one building out of our essentially MIDI lab into this other building where we would have this class on Tuesday nights. And then I was to take that. Uh, it was <laughs> I'm dating myself, but it was a real to real um, <laughs> machine that we were yeah. tracking to. I was supposed to take that home after the class because it was a night class. So it went from seven to ten. I would take it home at night and then the next morning I'd bring it back to school and I'd set it back up and rewire it and so we could use it during the week. And so this was early on. I had only been in the program maybe a few weeks and we the class got over. I had the thing in my, in my car and we were all like, hey, let's go out. Let's go down, have drinks done, you know, yeah. uh, in Coconut Grove in Miami. So uh, I literally only lived a mile from campus. But instead of going home and dropping the machine off, I just kept it in my car, which was a hatchback with a huge window in the back. Oh, no. And I drove down to this, <laughs> to to these bars and this, you know, fun area. And we all went out and had had a, drinks. And when I came back, the window was smashed and the thing was gone. Oh, man. And I had to go the next morning and tell the guy, the head of my program, that this machine had been stolen out of my car. And I, because I had gone down to the Coconut Grove and I didn't take it home. Oh, and I felt horrible. And he said to me, he's like, something is wrong with the way that you're thinking. I remember him saying that. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, the lesson for me was I was just 
a little, I was too trusting. I wasn't, um, you know, aware enough to think like, this is a bad idea. This isn't my property that I don't own. They've entrusted me with this mm. and I need to, I need to be responsible. And I was not responsible. Yeah. And I had, I, you know, I, re I ended up buying the school a new unit. Yeah. Um, cause I just felt like, you know, insurance didn't cover it cause it was off campus and they're like, sorry, if it had been stolen out of campus. Yeah. You know, but anyway, so that was my major life lesson. Like, yeah. Hey, wake, wake the freak up. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> this don't be dumb. <laughs> Something is wrong with the way that you're thinking. Yeah. That's hmm. just sounds like office space. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <It's amazing. laughs> okay. Uh, so before you dove fully in to, you know, take the leap off the cliff, go full time into music, what was the number one thing that kind of held you back from that? If you can identify. Uh huh. Um, I feel like just not belief in myself enough. You know, I think that, and, and that confidence, and I think that that can only come from trying and failing and trying and failing. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's it. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's that simple knowledge and confidence, really those mm. two things. And the only way to get them is to just start doing, Yeah. you know, totally. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. Yeah. Do you have something similar that you can kind of pinpoint? Where you jumped fully in? Um, I think I was always fully in, um, but I think it's like Chuck Norris. Yeah. It's just <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you know I, I, I am very confident. <laughs> it's not that I just I was fortunate no, enough to to always be doing music, yeah. and it wasn't like I had a day job and I was like, oh, I'm afraid to quit my day job and try sure. to do the music. Right. I was always doing the music, but I think for me, within doing the music. Um, you know, I probably played it safe for too long. Mm. And I would say that I underperformed given my skill set. Mm. And like Wendy said, the, you just have to be, you just have to do it. And, yeah. you know, if you want to be a songwriter, you need to write with other people and not be afraid of what they're going to think. Mm. You, you know, yeah, or that's if, huge. You know, yeah. you can spend all your life in the practice room, but at some point you got to get out and you've got a gig and you've got to play with other musicians and mm -hmm. you have to be afraid to, you know, do what you fear. You have to yeah. be, yeah. Right yeah, totally. we're dealing with a sign. Don't be afraid to suck or yeah, dare to suck. Dare yeah. to suck. I mean, yeah, you it's know, so true. And yeah. so it's, it's just taking that step and then getting that confidence and then the next step and then farther far, and farther. And pretty soon you're doing things that, you know, you look back on and you think, man, if, if I, you know, if my 20 year old self would would know that mm. when I'm here, I'm going to be doing this and I'm not even going to be nervous about it, I would have been no way, no way. You know, <laughs> Me too, I can't man. play, yeah. I can't yeah. play in, in front of 20,000 people in an arena. I'm yeah. afraid I'm going to play a wrong note, you yeah. know, yeah. and then you get to do it and you're like, this is this is great. And I'm fun. You know, I'm prepared. And, you know, prepared. preparation meets opportunity. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah. So good. So if you can, I, this may be a hard question to answer since you guys are just absolutely killing it right now. <laughs> what is one thing that's working for you right now? For me, it's easy. It comes down to a word, authenticity hmm. and, um, an intention. Yeah. It's, it's that simple. Um, I think about it every single day. Like, how do I want it to grow? What matters and why am I doing it? You know, um, because there's plenty of days that I feel like I take it on the chin mm. over and over. And, you know, I go home frustrated some days and some days I go home like literally wanting to scream hallelujah. <laughs> I do. And um, so I think it's like I have to think about it every single day. I do it because I love people. Yeah. I love music. I want to help people make money in music and I want us to all feel creatively satisfied and I want us to feel supported as a unit. Mm. Um, and that means the, the resonate family. And I know Kurt knows that about me. It's culture and caring and that's working for me. It's good. It's authenticity. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously I think we think along the same lines <laughs> and, and which is why we worked well together. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. um, Again, I come back to this, you know, I, I wrote with a guy not too long ago and, and it was the first time I had written with him and he called me a few days later and he said, I just, I'm doing this thing where when I feel grateful, I just go ahead and reach out and let the people know. Hmm. And he's like, I just want to tell you, you know, I appreciate you reaching out to me and for, for us to write and, and he said it felt like it had a purpose hmm. and that he hmm. doesn't feel like that a lot of times. Hmm. And so when I think of 
I mean, myself as a writer, but everybody else that we're working with, it's like, you know, more isn't the answer. I don't need, I don't need you to write a hundred songs, you know, yeah. for me. I need yeah. you to give me the right songs and let's be super dialed in. And if that, if that only means that I'm going to get, you know, from some artists, 10, you know, whatever, 10 songs a year, year or seven yeah. songs, and they're going to do some other things. Those seven songs are going to count. Yeah. And I know they're going to work yeah. because we work the way we work our system. It's going to find a home, it, maybe not right away, but it's not going to be a throwaway. And th that song is going to be so on point, you know, for one, two, three, four, five different things that we know it's just a matter of time. Mm. So we're not looking to blow this out into, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of tracks. We're not a music library. We're not a publisher that's just acquiring rights. Mm. You know, it's super strategic super dialed in and, and very relationship service yeah. focused sure and yeah. i think that's why it's working yeah so good and uh the last the force worker five full circle five um yeah. if you woke up tomorrow and the entire business had just kind of collapsed and you had mm -hmm. to start from square one you could do anything you still have all the relationships and the skill set that you have where would you start rebuild start over Start it all over again. The exact same thing again. Yeah. Um, I I think because for me, there's beauty in starting something. And there's also beauty in growing talent and evolving and growing together. I think that's actually more than the success. I know this sounds crazy. The success is great. But then there's an expectation. Hmm. And there is a responsibility when you get to that place. But that evolution and that growth and that scratching and that growing together. Honestly, it's my favorite because I still remember starting with Kurt in the first placement. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, and it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I would just start all over. It's good. Good answer. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. Mm. Um, I'm not very good at anything else. <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, there's, there's never been a plan B, but if it all, if it all, you know, unraveled, I, I think what, I mean, I, I always want to be creative, so I would still be creative in, in some form or fashion, even if it wasn't writing. Mm -hmm. But I've really enjoyed, um, you know, helping other people create and, and help steer the ship mm -hmm. and, and give feedback and speak into what they're working on. And um, everyone's been really receptive yeah. to us kind of helping them yeah. along the way and giving them an outside ear and another perspective. Mm. That's, um, I think, I mean, I'm in the unique position of doing what they do and being a producer. And not that my opinion is like, you know, that the, comes through clients. Yeah. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, they're always really, uh, pleased to get some feedback and to have some ideas yeah. in terms of, arrangement or even mix or you know just or, or big picture stuff yeah if you just change this one word you know it shifts the pers perspective from i to we and that's yeah. going to work better in sync yeah i mean yeah. simple things like that that they might not think about you know? sure right sure. it's good it's awesome so you guys obviously are i'm sure inundated with you know people wanting to work with you at this point um is there a way that people can kind of discover you you have a website people can find you at social media yeah we're actually about to launch we are the actually new the new website's launching next week. Um, and so what you can do there is you can actually submit um, that you want to get in touch with the company. We'll review the information. And, you know, if we if we feel like your music is something that we want to do or work with or um, we'll reach back out to you. Um, so there's definitely a new submission process on our website, um, kind of like inquiries, uh, because we, we do get inundated quite often now. And for me, it's not always if I love the music, because I love so much of the music. There's so much talent in Nashville. But it's also about, um, is it going to add something to the roster, to the family? Um, that's and different. That's different. Sure. And, and, that's, and also, exactly. Yeah. Kurt said it. It's different and needed mm. and complementary to what's there. Again, we really want to keep it boutique. Sure. Um, that That's intention and that's an authentic place for me. Sure. And so um, 
I value the relationships. Mm. I don't want it to be, this is a, a number, not a person. Yeah. There are and other companies that are in. That have grown so big and that's, that's fine. They you do know, what we do, but you know, you're, you're on their website and you're scrolling and scrolling. There's so many artists, so many artists. So many, and, and I just, yeah. you know, there, there's no way that we could be as um, involved yeah. and, you know, strategic no. with, if we had a hundred artists, it's yeah. just not going to happen. And yeah. I, so it's it's working really well and you know we're yeah. not looking for a thousand other no <laughs> you can't imagine I think, i'm sure you know, at this i'm point. always like yeah. how we would grow you know is more along the lines of you know more opportunities that we're getting from clients but as far as like the circle the circle of artists that we work with it's like you know that is going to always stay mm -hmm. pretty lean and mean sure um and and you know there will be some evolution with that with people and stuff or lots of collaboration sure lots sure. of collaboration with other companies and things like that but um yeah i'm not interested and neither is kurt into growing into something where we wouldn't be operating in the place that we feel so great it would become unmanageable and we just wouldn't be happy, right? You no, know, yeah. doing that. So yeah, so good. Well, you guys are busy. Thank you for taking the time yeah. to stop by and be on the Made It Music podcast. Wendy and Kurt, Resonate Music. What's the new website address? It's resonatemanagement.com. Resonatemanagement.com. Mm -hmm. Very cool. We'll post it in the okay. show notes and the links and yeah. everything. Awesome. So, thanks for being here. Today. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Yeah. It was awesome.